with the world. It's Food Wednesday. On her cooking show and through her cookbook, Patty Heenich made her name sharing the foods and traditions of her childhood in Mexico City. For the latest season of Patty's Mexican Table, Patty travels to Mexico, where she explores new takes on Mexican cuisine and tastes best of traditional street food. And for those of us who'd like to try some of the foods at home, but are perhaps a bit intimidated by some of the more elaborate recipes, Patty takes us into her kitchen, where she shares easy-to-make versions of familiar Mexican foods like tamales. She joins us in studio. Patty Heenish is the host of the public television series Patty's Mexican Table, and author of Patty's Mexican Table, The Secrets of Real Mexican Home Cooking. Patty, good to see you. So good to see you, Kojo. Thank you for having me in. You're welcome. Tell us a little bit about season four of your show. You filmed so, here in your kitchen in D.C., but also in Mexico. Yes. As I was um, telling a friend a couple of weeks ago, she was telling me, Patty, I saw the first episode of the fourth season and you look so much more relaxed and the food looks delicious. And I suddenly stopped and thought and I told her, you know, it took me three seasons to warm up. It took me 39 episodes to start getting a little bit better. So I feel like I've just started to hit the floor, you know, like I'm very comfortable very comfortable in the kitchen with the camera and I have evolved and the food that I am presenting has evolved as well. Season three and now season four are different from the first two seasons. Tell us what changed production wise. Yes. The so behind the scenes picture. The behind the scenes, which is a lot of fun. So the first two seasons I was working with a production company. They're great. They're called Cortez Brothers based in Los Angeles, but they specialized in commercials. They had no experience in cooking shows, but wanted to get into the cooking field. And I, of course, had zero experience in <laughs> being the host of a cooking show either. So we both took the plunge at the same time and um season one and season two you know we did our best it was you were heavily scripted it, so heavily scripted so i am not one good for scripts i am very good you know when i'm spontaneous and can connect with people and tell stories and what was hard for me kojo was that I would tell the writer from that production company, you know, the themes that I thought the episode should be, the stories behind the recipes, but then she would take my content content, and give it back to me in a script that I had to memorize. I've always been very bad at memorizing. And it had different words than the ones that I had used. And many of them were very hard for me, as you can tell by my accent. So it was quite challenging. With the third season we changed production company i'm working now i'm so very lucky to work with a production company based in new york they're called follow productions and they just open the door start rolling the camera and let me fly and the, and it's so much fun because we get you know unexpected things we travel to mexico and we know we want to hit some places and meet certain people and find certain ingredients but then it's just completely open now they have a lot more work because we you have, have so much editing, content. Yes. <laughs> yes. So very heavy on the editing. But for me, I mean, in the first seasons, I used to get the rough cuts of the episodes and I used to look at them and send back, you know, 10 pages of notes. You weren't speaking in your voice in the first two seasons. Exactly. And also it was, we were so excited about doing this show that they told me, you know, you have to wear these makeup and have your hair this way and wear the hoops, which I don't wear. And it was sort of, I had to go through a lot to find who I am. Go through a lot of hoops. Go through a <laughs> lot of hoops. Exactly, exactly. In order to find where you were. But now you have found where you are. You are more natural. You are not scripted. You are being you, speaking in your own voice. But I'd like to back up for a moment because your background is so interesting. You were born and raised in Mexico City. And you attribute your love of food to your family, for whom food was always central. Tell us a little bit about your family and the cooking that you grew up with. Yes. Kojo, I always like to say that I grew up with food maniacs. And they crazy food <laughs> maniacs. I have three sisters, so we're four girls. And all of them are in the food world. One is a chef, has a restaurant in Miami. One runs a restaurant in Mexico City. One is a vegan that they've 
fabulous recipes for the eating and living. And I was the intellectual, I was a political analyst and I jumped into the food scene later on, but I was always obsessed with eating. And many people wonder, you know, when four girls get together, do they talk about their husbands and their parents and politics or, you know, with chatty things, but we only talk about food, Kojo, and what recipe you've tried, what have you tried, and everything growing up revolved around food. You grew up in a family of food maniacs, and you are still in a family of food maniacs. In case you're just joining us, our guest is Patty Heenich. She is the host of the public television series, Patty's Mexican Table, and author of the book, Patty's Mexican Table, The Secrets of Real Mexican Home Cooking. Give us a call at 800 433-8850. If you have questions or comments for Patty, do you have a favorite Mexican dish? Where do you go for Mexican food? Have you tried new twists on traditional recipes? Did you grow up in a food maniac, or let's make that food-centric home, <laughs> or recipes and traditions did your family hand down? 800-433-8850. You can send email to kojo at wamu.org. Shoot us a tweet at Kojo Show, or go to our website, kojoshow.org, where you can watch our live video stream there, and you can also send questions or comments to us. You were born and raised in Mexico City, but your background is Mexican and Jewish. Where does the Jewish side come into your family food traditions? I, it's been it's been a puzzle that's been hard to put together, Kojo. I've always struggled with the different parts of my identity, to be completely honest. Which, you know, it's hard because I am so transparent all the time. <laughs> which is why we love to have you here. We can see through you. But, um, I wasn't that comfortable with that part of my identity until, you know, a few years ago. I was struggling. It was, um, you know, being Mexican and Jewish at the same time. And then it got even more complicated. I mean, there's a big Jewish community in Mexico. It's just that my family wasn't an active um, part of that community growing up at all. Um, but then I moved to the US and then suddenly I wasn't seen as a Mexican and people were surprised when they found out I was a Mexican Jew. I'll tell you a story. I went the first time I went on national TV or, you know, big live TV was as a guest of Paula Dean, who's mm -hmm. so charming and adorable. And she had me on and I was going to teach her some traditional authentic Mexican dishes. And she looked at me and the first thing she said, well, you don't look Mexican at all. And so I started from the bottom. No, like, no, 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 I really am Mexican, Mexican, 100%. And then she's like, what's that last name? And I go, Jinich. And she's like, Jewish? Mexican Jewish? Like, it was so difficult to put all the pieces together. But the same thing happened when I moved to Texas, which was the first uh, place we lived in the U.S. And being in the U.S. as an immigrant and um you know mexican that's trying to establish and and anyway it, it all was really confusing even to me now remember last year thanksgiving and hanukkah happened at the same time yep. well that was one blissful for me <laughs> <laughs> because in the kitchen i was able to create these you know these potato um, like little pancake, which is traditional for Hanukkah. And I made it with sweet potato and potato and tart apple. And I dressed it with a fennel tangy Mexican crema and some salsa matcha, which is made with ground peanuts and dried chipotles. And it was this like perfect mix of Jewish, Mexican, and being in the American kitchen celebrating Thanksgiving. And it is like suddenly all of my pieces came together without no conflict and no clash. And the, the kitchen is so blissful in that way, Kojo. Well, should I call you Hinich or like Paula Dean, Jinich? <laughs> Hinich is good. Thank you. <laughs> we got an email from Shanti Patty. Yes. Shanti writes, people get confused when they see my Latino face and look at my Indian name and my Jewish last name. Being Mexican is so much more to what your name is, the color of your skin and the food you like to eat. She said, growing up in a Jewish Catholic Hindu family, we celebrated Christmas with rye bread, cream cheese, lox, dill, capers, tomato, and cucumber slices. Our lentils would be topped with plain yogurt instead of sour cream. And we ate white rice with yogurt instead of what they call here Spanish rice. So there you have another very diverse upbringing. You have the same kind of thing. When yes. you, you would enjoy your 
your Jewish dishes with Mexican flavors. Yes. It's hard to believe, but you've said that when you got married, you did not know how to scramble an egg. Did not. Remind us about the, well, circuitous route that you took to a career focused on Mexican cuisine. <laughs> yes. So I wanted to be a philosopher, Kojo. I wanted to... You went to school. To, I went, yes, and I and I ended up studying political science. You're with policy analyst. I, yes, I was a <laughs> policy analyst, and I focused on Mexican history and the evolution of democracy and democratic institutions, and I wanted to help in any way with ideas to help those um, institutions strengthen. And then when we moved to the U.S., I wanted to work with the Mexican communities in the U.S. And I was crazy nostalgic about Mexican food. That's what happened. Your husband knew that. He knew that, and he kept saying, Patty, in the kitchen, in the kitchen. Look at all your sisters. They're all in the kitchen. They're so happy. And I kept thinking, I married a macho man. My mom warned me because my mom warns against all men. Um, <laughs> and, and I thought, he doesn't want me to flourish. He doesn't want me to work. It was, of course, the opposite. I am a policy analyst. Exactly. So I, I kept, kept on studying. But just by chance, I, um, I was finishing my, finishing my thesis, and I had a lot of time on my hands, and I love public TV and public radio. And I went and knocked on the door of the public TV station of Dallas and said, hey, I have a lot of spare time. Can I help? And they said... And they had they were working on a documentary about the Mexican Revolution, which I am so passionate about. I even had an episode called The Foods of the Mexican Revolution. <laughs> uh, great foods. Um, and they said, we don't have that more, but we have a cooking show in Mexico with Chef Stephen Piles. Can you help us with that? And so I had been living in the U.S. for a couple of years in like no man's land in Dallas, where there's Spanish, but not really Mexican, Mexican food, but didn't taste like home. And then suddenly so nostalgic. I go to Mexico with a bunch of Americans. We call them gringos, but I call my kids gringos too. So nobody should get insulted. So I'm here with a group of Americans and I'm in charge of interpreting Mexican culture and food to them. And I felt such a responsibility and everything seemed so colorful and so wonderful. And I had the most fun I've ever had. And I came back and of course my hun my husband was like, see? <laughs> and anyway, when I back, told you so. I told you so. We moved to DC. I yanked myself back to policy, studied a master's in Latin American studies in Georgetown, went to work at a think tank. Um, and after a year, I was asked to write a paper about the differences between the um, development of democracy in Peru and Mexico. And instead of doing that, I started researching the differences in their ceviches. And I went to <laughs> my boss and said, I'm sorry, I think I have to do something else. And I quit <laughs> and, I, and I enrolled in La Academia de Cuisine for their intensive um, nighttime uh, classes because by then I had two kids and I started writing about Mexican food and switched. Actually, I'm studying their ceviches, okay? I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to the show. As we said, you filmed both in Mexico and yes. in the U.S. Yes. You went to a beautiful city that is well known to tourists. Tell us about Guanajuato. Yes, Guanajuato is a beautiful, charming city. It is the capital of a state no, uh, named under with the same name, Guanajuato, in the state of Guanajuato. And it is also the state where San Miguel de Allende is. So I went to both places and they're so different, Kojo. So San Miguel is, this is fascinating, talking about how Mexican food has evolved in Mexico and in the U.S. with all of the Mexican diaspora, right? So Mexican food evolves inside of Mexico, but Mexican food also evolves in the U.S. and it's beautiful. We have like new regional cuisines that are no longer south of the border. Well, I met the in San Miguel de Allende. I know you asked about Guanajuato, I promise. Muchos gringos in San Miguel. So many gringos, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> waiting for the Cinco de Mayo party. <laughs> but um, I met with the community, big community, because we were working with them of, they call themselves the Gringo Mex, which are the kids of all the Americans that settled in San Miguel 20, 30 years ago a huge community and there's all these young hip artsy cool you know young generation 
that has the completely different side of the tortilla. We get the Mexican Americans here in the U.S., like my kids, you know, and you know millions of other Mexican Americans. But here you have what they call themselves the Gringo Mex. So you have here Mexican Americans that celebrate Mexican Independence Day. Of course, we all now celebrate Cinco de Mayo, etc. In the U.S., you have these Gringo Mex who are celebrating Fourth of July <laughs> and Halloween in mexico and it is just so fascinating um we have these like different sub dimensions that somehow connect and have some similarities but okay back to guanajuato it's all about food though we've got to take a short break we'll talk about all of that when we come back and if you have calls stay on the line we'll get to your calls too if you haven't called yet but you'd like to the number is 800-433-8850 if you like to cook how do you fit it into your schedule do you have quicker variations. We'll talk about that too. 800-433-8850. Go to our website, kojoshow.org. Watch the live video stream and join the conversation there. I'm Kojo Nam. Welcome back. Our guest is Patty Heenich. She is the host of the public television series, Patty's Mexican Table. She's author of the book, Patty's Mexican Table, The Secrets of Real Mexican Home Cooking. We've invited your calls at 800-433-8850. Before we get there, Patty has to finish explaining her trips to at least two places. We were talking about San Miguel when you left. You had a great experience that you were told stories. You were invited to people's homes. Spontaneity was a part of that trip, wasn't it? It was completely, and it really has to do with the team that I'm so privileged to be working with, um, Kojo, Dan Connell, who is the series producer. He just has so much fun with me. You know, like we have an idea, we have a theme, and then he lets me fly. Like say, we were scheduled to go and tape at a restaurant. Oh, this is really fascinating. You love this. So <laughs> here, I'm a woman, I just switched topics, right? Yeah. So here in the US, we met with Mexican American chefs and see what they're doing with Mexican food. In Mexico, we met with an expat, Donnie Masterson. He has a restaurant in San Miguel de Allende and he makes incredible, you know, Mexican food and his interpretation of it. But say we would be on the way to meet Donnie and I'd happen to run into a panaderia and I could smell that the bread has just been made and this is like you have to take it right in the moment because Correct. if not you have to wait until five in the morning the next day and everybody in the team is so used at me saying we have to do this but we have to do this now can we switch a little can we you know just like now we're switching conversations and we'd go in and everybody is so open when you're enthusiastic and of course you have a camera yeah. um and so we'd have these conversations and they'd invite us behind the panaderia and this one lady invited us to her home to see how she did things and the great thing about not having script is that you can have all those stories you're having way too much fun you had way too much fun too doing much fun. this because spontaneity is what patty is really all about but 
back now to Guana, <laughs> Guanajuato because you, while you were there, you focused probably spontaneously on street <laughs> foods. Why? Why street foods? Because you walked, okay, Guanajuato, first of all, is a shocking sight. You get there and it is a city that has been built. It used to be a mining town and it's like built on a huge hillside and all the houses seem to be going down and way down at the bottom there's these gorgeous historic buildings and these cobblestone streets that go inside what used to be a water channel it's just like out it's it's like science fiction but it's not it's so gorgeous and then there's street food all over the place kojo but it's not like a little snack here and there like you could have all of your meals with that street food let me give you a few examples one is a torta and all of these are not that well known um outside of mexico we need to spread the word um one is a torta you know a crusty sandwich that is called aguajolota like wild turkey um and the guajolota there's this one man that sells them right outside of this callejón del beso which is called the valley of the kiss did you know that mexico also has a romeo and juliet story no okay so this is where that happened and it is even more it's just even more tragic than the real romeo and juliet's you know story and people go there and kiss um, just like in the uh, Juliet. Are we still talking about street food here? Yes, but this man, okay, so this man sells, has his little stand with guajolota tortas that he sells to every couple that wants to go and kiss oh. in his valley. It's like the perfect spot. And these, and you have to eat those tortas with this guy, okay? And he's there from a certain hour to a certain hour because there are other guajolotas, but his are the guajolotas to have. So you're telling the cameras we have to be there at a particular time. Yes. And that is the incredible thing about street food and why I wanted to focus on street food because in Mexican street food, Kojo, there is so much pride. I mean, the torta stand has probably been passed down from his dad to the grandfather you know it says the lopez and it is the lopez with pride and it is they make a lot of the things that go into the street food that you're taking at home so it's stews and things that have been cooked with fresh great ingredients and then they're, they're quickly assembled but it's not like what you see here at as street food so i wanted to share that and convey that and then of course tell people how they can make that street food and have that street food experience at well, home. There are a lot of people who want to know how to make stuff. And so we're going to start um, with Mark in Washington, D.C. Mark, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Patty, I had the great opportunity to meet you twice doing your son's bar mitzvahs. And I'd just like to let everybody know, you not only know your food, but you also know how to host a party. These were the most incredible dancing. When I told people we are working a Mexican Jew party, people are kind of like bar mitzvah, really? The parties were incredible off the hook, but the best one was the last go around. You came in, an incredible event, but you, when you accidentally slipped five minutes into it and you wound up hosting the party perched on a bar stool with a bag of ice in the middle of the dance floor <laughs> in severe pain and let no one know it was the most incredible evening. It hey, really Mark, I'm well, recognizing you, just, you. You just let everyone know. That <laughs> <laughs> he carried me out because I couldn't move. Hola, Mark. Thank you for calling. Mark, thank Actually, you. I didn't really carry you out. We pushed you out on a rolling light case. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, but it's just wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful culture. Mark, thank Thank you very much for that call and that memory. You also, while you were in Mexico, met local chefs who are infusing Mexican cooking with new culinary ideas. Can you talk a little bit about what you wanted to learn about contemporary Mexican cooking? Yes, yes, and that is such a great topic because there are many purists who say Mexican food has to be exactly like it was made in the 18th century or the 19th century. But here's the thing, there are some fabulous traditional dishes and regional cuisine pillars that have to be preserved and have to be passed down and they're incredible and delicious but just as here in the u.s in mexico the food is evolving mexican cooks and mexican chefs are being adventurous and they're playing with new ingredients or with the basic traditional ingredients in different ways so 
evolution and experimentation helps a cuisine stay alive. Like if it has strong pillars, then it can, it can withstand experimentation and new spins and things. So I've learned to free myself as well of thinking, oh, I have to do this a certain way. And if you know your basics, you know your ingredients, you can stretch a little in place. Sometimes experiments go really badly and you need to, that's the thing, you need to know when to discard them. On to the own. phones again. Here's yes. Iris in Alexandria, Virginia. Iris, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi. Hi, Kojo. It's wonderful. Thank you for having me on. Um, I lived in San Miguel Allende. I ran away from home when I was about 19 years old. I'm in my late 30s now. And I had the best experience. I found myself there. And I agree that the street food is absolutely the best there. Uh, I think they're called Elotes Locos. Oh my gosh, uh, yes. The corn with the with the cheese and the and I'm wondering what cheese that is. It is queso cotija, most typically, which is a dry aged salty cheese. Um it's very similar to ricotta salata or to queso romano. And you know what you can use as well, which is practically a cousin, a cousin of the uh, queso cotija, the parmesan cheese. It's cojo. That's it's fascinating. The cousin? It's like a cousin. It's like the Oaxaca cheese from Mexico. <laughs> is like the cousin of the mozzarella cheese from Italy. They're made. They're cheeses that are made with the same process. But you know, like the mozzarella cheese, when it's made, it's like a rope cheese. And when the mozzarella is made, is broken like that into pieces. Well, in Mexico, we roll it as if it was a thread. But it's the same product i mean of course italian cows may have different weather than um oaxaca cows but well i'm glad we are having a live video stream that you can see at kojoshow.org because she's showing me exactly how you roll it and exactly how you stretch it and <laughs> iris did you get all of this yeah i just wanted to say one more thing uh <laughs> i have not found good mexican food northern mexican food until recently in alexandria virginia there's a restaurant called La Mexicana Taqueria and Bakery, and I invite you both to check it out. Where well, is that? It's very authentic. Where is it? it? it it's off a of Richmond Highway um, down near Hybla Valley. Well, here are a kind few more. In a little weird shopping center, but it's definitely worth going to eat. I'm sure they don't appreciate you calling the shopping center little and weird, but here's, here's, <laughs> a, few, here's a few other recommendations. Yeah, if you eat there, you'll go there every week. Here's a few other recommendations we had, Iris. We heard from people about their candidates for favorite me Mexican restaurants in our area. Natalie loves District Taco near the Warner Theater. Many love Taqueria Distrito Federal on 14th Street. And L'Oreal Plaza got some people's vote. You too can tell us what's your favorite, 800-433-8850. You can send email to kojo at wamu.org or tell us by way of tweet at Kojo Show. Speaking of interpretations of Mexican food, Patty, Mexican food in this country has been evolving. In many ways, it's becoming more regional. Mexican in Texas or California or New York is very different, isn't it? So different, Kojo. You have Tex-Mex, you have New Mex, you have Cal Mex, you have Arizona Mex, you have New York Mex, you have Chicago Mex. And this is the fascinating thing that you have as we're talking about this diaspora of Mexicans in the U.S. So what happens is you have people usually from the same state or region going together to a similar area in the U.S. And there they planned their baggage of knowledge and recipes and how to use the ingredients with the local where they're establishing and where they're setting you know setting up and growing roots so you have a blend of poblano cuisine with new york because there's so many poblanos mm -hmm. you have a lot of zacatecas mixed with la you and there's all these new regional cuisines that are of are sort of seeping through the borders and making, in a way, cuisine be borderless. And I think that many people are threatened by it. Oh, now you don't know what's American and what's Mexican. Well, let me tell you something. In Mexico, we've been eating hamburgers and hot dogs <laughs> and pizza for over a century. And we've we been have, infiltrated a long time ago. Yeah, we've been playing with it. And I have, even I have a, a Okay, I have an episode called Mex Americana yes. where I make two incredible pizzas. One is a carne asada and cebollita pizza, and another one is a poblano chili, zucchini, corn, and ricotta cheese pizza. And 
So the, I think there shouldn't be any threat. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, you preserve things and as long as you know the identities of things and how things have been traditionally, you can blend and create new things. And it's like you're creating more. It's like a virtuous cycle. Well, here in Washington, D.C., Mexican food is, well, likely to be Salvadorian. Yes. <laughs> hitting, a, hitting a sensitive spot. A very there. sensitive area. Yes. So I love pupusas. I think pupusas are wonderful. But don't give me a taco in a pupusa. That's, that's why, I, you know, I think there's things that work and things that don't work. If you're going to have a sign that says authentic traditional Mexican food, you owe it to your customers to give them that. You can say, if you want to say salva mex, great, give me a pupusa with the chicken tinga on top. But I think <laughs> people should know sort of what they're eating. And I think Salvadorian food is so delicious and Mexican food is so delicious. But sometimes the lines get blurred in a way that it confuses the customer. I'd ask you where... You go for great Mexican food around here, but you're likely to choose just any other type of cuisine when you eat out. And <laughs> yes. when you do eat Mexican here, you have seen more chefs here interpreting Mexican food as well. Chorizo burgers and other fusions. Yes. So I was, you know, we went and taped with Chef Albarran in Mission, a restaurant in Dupont Circle where he has an incredible chorizo burger. And we went and taped also Chef Colin King at Oyamel. I think my favorite Mexican in DC by far is Oyamel. Is Oyamel? They have incredible tacos and they've gone to train in Mexico and they have their spins, of course, you know, and creative things. But I think quality wise, it's pretty incredible. So Jose Andres doesn't throw some Spanish in there? He throws his interpretations of things, <laughs> but I think they all work. That's yeah. the thing. And his tortillas are melting your mouth, you know, and the tongue tacos are like to die for. Um, but I think... There's all these new things. There's I, I'm just writing the ones you said, you know, La Mexicana Bakery and District Taco because there's so many that I want to try. And I think the more time goes by, the more Mexican you see, there's modern and traditional and Mexican chefs that are coming from Mexico to the U.S., showing what they want to do with Mexican food that's different, what they had been doing. You have Chef Enrique Olvera in New York in his Cosme restaurant presenting Mexican food in an extremely modern way, which is also delicious. You also found that your own approach to cooking has changed over time. Tell us a little bit about where you started when you began cooking Mexican a decade ago. Yes. So it's changed radically. And I think it's changed with me being longer here and with my kids growing here. Um, I started, when I started cooking, uh, teaching Mexican cooking at the Mexican Cultural Institute, I wanted to share what everybody here called the real Mexican food. So make a food from Puebla, food from Oaxaca, food from you know, different regions and historical times. Because remember, I have the political analyst background. So That's I right, love tying that in. But I felt like I had to be really loyal to the way things have been made. Consistent with history. Consistent yeah. with history. And as time has gone on, I've sort of freed myself and let myself um, interpret things and develop new things that are, says me, really delicious. And... Mexican, of course, because I also see Mexican chefs and cooks in Mexico doing all these sorts of wild things. I think like there's been an opening up of what we can do with Mexican You food. say you like to tread two paths now in your cooking. Yes. What does that mean? That means I love recreating traditional recipes and dishes in my kitchen and sharing them with people. So a woman in Michigan may send me an email and say, hey, I was born here. My grandmother was from Zacatecas. She used to make, the, make these piggy cookies for me or these mole. I can't find the recipe. Help me. I have 
so many historical cookbooks and I love researching and testing and many of these old old recipes don't have normal measures so they will say grab a bucket full of flour and grab two mangoes the size of your fist well <laughs> you know because they were written in the 18th century so I love testing and recreating and preserving things that can be passed along I think that is a beautiful thing so that is one path and the other one is playing and experimenting and feeling empowered in the kitchen to create new things. Because the 21st century fist might not be the same as the 18th century fist. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Or the bucket. Who knows how exactly big were those right. buckets? Here's Pedro in Glen Burnie, Maryland. Pedro, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, uh, Kojo. A uh, long-time listener, uh, first-time caller. Oh, I, thank you. I, I got very lucky to uh, get inside my vehicle and Uh, one of my favorite ch subjects, uh, Mexican food. Uh, I've been in the area since 2002. I, uh, I am originally from, uh, was born in Mexico, raised in Texas, uh, served in the military in San Diego, and I transferred to this area. Uh, the one thing that I didn't find out here was, you know, traditional or, or, or uh, restaurants that had my flavor in it. You know, I tried a lot of these uh, um, uh, restaurants that, you know, yeah. claim to have... Tell the truth. Food, Tell the truth. You were looking for your mother's flavor, weren't you? Yes. Yes, I was. But, I know uh, these you things. Know, <laughs> I was just disillusioned time after time. So, you know, usually I, I, I had just given up. And, uh, you know, I would consider myself, like I said, the authority. So I did find a real good restaurant here in the Glen Burnie area. It's uh, right next to a Honda dealership uh, in Crane Highway. The name of the restaurant is uh, La Sirenita, which in English means uh, the mermaid. And... They have the best caldo de res, other than my mother's, of course, <laughs> that I've tasted uh, so far. And part of it is just the ingredients and the sauce that they use. Uh, and by that, I mean it's the queen chili sauce that you know, the customer is able to put on. So, um, you know, any of your uh, listeners out there that are looking for good Mexican food, you know, Closest, like my friends ask Closest me. thing to Pedro's mom's cooking. Pedro, thank you very much for your call. We've got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our Food Wednesday conversation with Patty Heenich. She's the host of the public television series Patty's Mexican Table and author of Patty's Mexican Table, The Secrets of Real Mexican Home Cooking. You can follow this conversation at our website, kojoshow.org. Watch the live video stream there, ask questions or make comments, or give us a call, 800-433-8850. I'm Kojo Nandi. Welcome back. Our guest is Patty Heenich. She is the host of the public television series Patty's Mexican Table and author of the book Patty's Mexican Table, The Secrets of Real Mexican Home Cooking. We got an email from Catherine in Springfield, Virginia, who says, This isn't fair, Kojo. I fully intended to turn the radio off, and now you have The biggest effect that Patty has had on my family is that now my sister is talking about cooking, trying different ingredients, and telling me about recipes that she has made. You have no idea 
how significant this is. Thank you, Patty, writes Catherine. Mm. And somebody's been tweeting about Mexican men in the kitchen. Yeah, somebody just sent a question and it says, what are her thoughts on Latino men in the kitchen? How is that seen in Latino Mexican culture? That is a strong subject. I hope um, your husband's listening. <laughs> okay, I adore my husband, Kojo. I feel the luckiest woman, really. He's <laughs> such a good husband and such a great father. He does not pour cereal into a bowl. Um, I, but I hope he's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> he knows I complain, but he'll eat everything, everything I make. He travels a lot. He's a workaholic, but he'll tr he'll eat everything and anything I eat. And if I leave the kids at home with him, then I don't want to know what. Okay, other they Mexican eat. men. Other Mexican men. Okay, <laughs> so traditionally, it's been women in the kitchen. I mean, for centuries, it's been women in the kitchen, and there's a lot of pride of the role of the woman and the motherly and the nurturing and then and the having the time but i would say starting like 15 or 20 years ago there's been a new cadre of men going in the kitchen and they're doing a lot of the new um modernist molecular with torches and instruments and scientific things doing things to mexican food i think it's fascinating i think it stretches the limits it's fun some some people complain and say oh that's not really mexican but i think it you know there's room for everything and i think more and more you see men latino men in the kitchen and i think that women find it incredibly sexy well in that so, case guys you can find a link to all the recipes from season four of patty's mexican table at our website kojoshow.org including chicken and salsa verde tamal casserole you can find at our website kojoshow.org in this season of patty's mexican table we also get to share taco night with your family we're feeling envy imagining that imagining what taco night is like at your house your family loves taco night but you say it makes you feel a bit like a gringo <laughs> A total green guy. Now that we're getting close to Cinco de Mayo, I always say, if you have a Cinco de Mayo themed party, you're not Mexican. Um, <laughs> if you but, have a taco night. <laughs> so that's a thing that here in the U.S. people love theme nights, and and I think it's a great idea to rally people around the table. But as I was telling a friend, you know, in Mexico we eat tacos every day, even if it's not a taco, we always have corn or flour tortillas on the table. So whatever you're eating, you're tucking a bit of it into a taco and drizzling a little bit of salsa, and you end up eating tacos. So there's no such thing as taco night. You go visit your house here in the <laughs> U.S. So we started the tradition of taco night. Once here with my gringo kids, my Mexican American kids, they started asking for taco night, even though we have tortillas at home every day. But so we started this tradition and the kids love it. And sometimes they'll have friends over and their friends love it. And it is something that rallies everybody around the table. So I think that is fabulous. But when we were in Mexico taping tacos and my kids were there, um, we said, you know, talking with Dan, who I tell you is so open sure. about doing new things. He said, Patty, do you do taco night? And I'm like, no, we don't do taco <laughs> night. And my kids turn around and they're like, ma, of course we do taco night. Because <laughs> I'm like in denial of the, and I'm like, yeah, we do. So let's do taco night. So it was so funny, Kojo, because we were taping in San Miguel de Allende in a Mexican kitchen and we're having taco night in Mexico. It's very embarrassing. Very embarrassing. For those looking for inspiration beyond <laughs> ground beef and shredded lettuce can you talk about the possibilities of the humble yet complex taco oh my gosh the taco universe it is just so immense it is endless it is so beautiful it's a meal that you put on your hand and tucked into a tor tortilla and it can be anything and there's so many possibilities you can go as hardcore as you want you can make your own masa these days you can buy your masa you can make your masa from masarina you can buy great tortillas and all you need to do is choose do you want it veggie do you want it meat do you want it chicken there always has to be a salsa because that as i say in the in the introduction of my cookbook kojo i said that they're the maracas of my kitchen they're, they just shake things up and they add a little sizzle so 
the taco can be absolutely anything and everything. And I mean, I'll tell you what my favorite taco is. Tell me. My favorite taco, because you really want to know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm um, writing. My favorite taco is a warm corn tortilla. And it takes one minute for it to heat. And directly on the fire, it's even better because it gets a little charred. And then some ripe slices of Mexican avocado. Buttery, like creamy, a little sprinkle of salt. And then I go sweet with a little bit of honey or spicy with chipotle and adobo sauce. And a couple of those make my best meal. We were talking earlier about new spins on Mexican food. And one aspect has to do with preparation time because time is something most people don't have. There's no shame in adapting complex recipes to make them quicker. It's something you find yourself doing when you need to get dinner on the table. All the time. So for example, the tamal, which is also a beautiful thing, and there's tamales in all Latin American countries, but in Mexico we pride ourselves with our tamales. The tamales are usually a communal activity. You get together with your aunts and your cousins and a whole lot of other families and a whole lot of other families and you make tamales for a whole Saturday for the Saturday fiesta. You know, it's a communal thing. When you make tamales, you have to make the filling, you have to make the dough, and then you have to wrap them one by one. It's very laborious it's and time consuming. People. Yes. But you can do the same thing in a casserole and it's beautiful. You just you know, layer the masa, add the filling of your choice. My favorite is chicken and salsa verde, which I think one of our callers liked. And then you top it with another layer of masa, a lot of Mexican crema, grated melty cheese, in the oven it goes, and you have a tamal casserole that's very genuine. And many people in Mexico do that, but um, you can do it too. And you can find the recipe for the tamal casserole at our website, kojoshow.org. Most of us are probably familiar with Mexican tamales, but there are many variations. There are also variations within Mexico, including sweet tamales made with butter. Yes, sweet tamales made with butter and sweet tamales made with corn. One of my favorite tamales are a tamal called uchepos, and they come from the state of Michoacán, where actually most of the Mexican avocados grow because it's volcanic soil and a lot of rain. Anyway, um, these tamales are made with tender corn, and a little bit of milk, and a little bit of sugar, and that's it. On to Angela in Alexandria, Virginia. Angela, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Patty and Kojo. I would love it if you would speak about menudo, because for me, that's the true test of a Mexican restaurant, and there's very few restaurants who will make it and then make it well, because it is uh, tripe or panza and a pig foot. And you have to flavor it very well to get that uh, special flavor. <laughs> I'll defer to Patty. <laughs> yes, and it is delicious. And did you know that that is one of the most popular hangover foods? I mean, <laughs> after a Mexican wedding or a Mexican fiesta at 6 or 7 in the morning, people are looking for that menudo. It's quite simple, really. It's like a lot of Mexican stews that have meat or pancita or a pig's foot or chicharron. It is that meat that is simmered with onion and garlic and your usual suspects, you know, aromatic herbs. And then that is flavored with one or another kind of chili that has been rehydrated and plumped up, you know, the dried chilies, mm -hmm. and then turned into sort of a paste and that's used to seize on the broth. And it's delicate yet really filling. And then you can garnish it with a little bit of lime juice, some chopped cilantro, chopped white onion. But I agree with you. We need some more restaurants. And yes. Recommendation off of Richmond Highway. Tacos El Costalia is very good with their menudo. What's the name again? Tacos yeah. El Costalia. Oh. Tacos El Costalia. Thank you very much for your call. Um, we're running out of time, but for people who want to dive in and try making the more elaborate Mexican dishes in their own kitchens, some are complex to make things like enchiladas and mole poblano. But before getting discouraged, people should realize that even in Mexico, those dishes are not everyday foods that people just whip up on a weeknight after work. Generally, there's an occasion and many people are involved in the preparation. Yes, it's as I, as I was saying, the chiles en nogada, the mole poblano, they're 
celebratory foods that that's why in Mexico we all come together around the food but there's there's steps that you can take to make it easy and I do that I'll take a recipe that's very laborious and I'll test it a thousand times Kojo until I make a rendition that's just as good that doesn't sacrifice the soul of the dish but that people can make it you know in less than 48 hours a thousand times <laughs> She does exactly. So for our home cooks, can we start with some basics? Many Mexican recipes call for chiles, and chiles can be intimidating for those of us who are not familiar with many varieties. Can you give us a quick one-minute primer on some common chiles used in Mexican cooking? Of course, habanero is the spiciest. They're lovely and beautiful and cute, but also spicy. Where? Next, I would say the serrano, which is my favorite. It's similar to the jalapeño. It's thinner. It's longer and it's grassy, it's fresh, it's delicious. The jalapeño, which is sort of spicy, but you can get some milder ones. Then the blonde one or banana pepper is milder than the jalapeño. The poblano is exuberant and very capricious. It can be mild or not. I'll give everybody a tip on how to tame your chilies. Soak them in hot water with a tablespoon of dark brown sugar. Or have them when they're lovely, cute, and feisty. You enjoy them <laughs> that way. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Patty Hinich is the host of the public television series, Patty's Mexican Table. She's author of the book, Patty's Mexican Table, The Secrets of Real Mexican Home Cooking. Patty, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Kojo. The Kojo Nam, the show is produced by Michael Martinez, Ingelisa Schwarzdorf, Taylor Burney, Kathy Golgar, Elizabeth Weinstein, and Emily Bermans. Our web producer is Ruth Tam. Brendan Sweeney is the managing producer. Our engineer is Meg Bunting. Natalie Yurov Lifker is on the phones. Thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nam. Coming up tomorrow on the Kojo Nam, the show U.S. Senator Ben Cardin negotiated giving Congress oversight of any future Iran nuclear deal. He joins us to discuss that. Then at one, it's your turn to set the agenda. Cuba comes off the list of terrorist states. Presidential politics heat up early on, and the free-range parenting debate makes headlines again. The Kojo Nam, the show noon till two tomorrow on WAMU 88.5 and streaming at kojoshow.org.
the jurisdictions decide that they're going to have specific age limits, one again wants to say, who decides? The jurisdictions, the jurisdictions decide that they're going to have specific age limits. One again wants to say, who decides at what that age limit? Because children of, of, of the same of pudding, my expression's always been the proof is in the pudding. Does it work? And this works. It works to help our students. They're happy. Um, they come to school on a regular basis. It's introduced to a concept they're going to talk about in class. He then goes into the class, and now rather than being the slowest person to get it, Thank <laughs> you.